welcome to this latest edition of Breaking Down Barriers. This is a program where we look at different stigmas when it comes to research, social stigmas, or even just educational stigmas that may be out there and the barriers that the community faces. We do this in order to um, address those challenges and help create a platform for open conversations between the community, as well as professionals who have an expertise in these related fields to really um, bring those conversations to the forefront and make them more manageable to understand and absorb and hopefully create a well-informed and educated community of young people globally impacted by HD. I have the pleasure of having some fantastic uh, community members with us um, and I'll let them introduce themselves and first I'm going to start off with Dr. Hugh Ricards. Hi, I'm Hugh Ricards. I'm a professor of neuropsychiatry in Birmingham and I've worked with HD and I did my first clinic in 1993 in genetics when the when the uh, test individual test first came out. So I've been, I think I've done about 100,000 hours of contact time with people with HD over the last 30 years. Um, so I'm, I'm interested in drug access, but we'll probably come to that, won't we, Jenna? We absolutely will. Thanks for that introduction. I'm curious, how did you keep track of those 100,000 hours? Did you have a would... pegboard? No, it's just the back of an envelope calculation. <laughs> it's a lot of tally marks. It's roughly, I sort of added it up and had a, yeah, it might, it's probably within the, it's within a factor of about five or six of the real, of the real thing. It's close, I would imagine, close. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for that introduction. Lauren, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, I'm Lauren Holder. I live in North Carolina. Um, I am gene positive for HD and a longtime patient advocate. Uh, an HDO ambassador, a member of HD Community Advisory Board, um, and I do a podcast for the HD community uh, through Help for HD International. Um, I was also a caregiver for my father uh, for several years who passed away in January of 2021. Thanks for sharing that. And last but not least, Molly. Hi, I'm Molly. I'm from Northern Ireland, and I'm a PhD researcher based in the University of Birmingham. Uh, where I look at Parkinson's and kind of social cognition, which has a lot of overlap with Huntington's. My mom is HD positive and I'm untested. Um, but yeah, uh, I also am on the board for the um, HD charity in Northern Ireland and uh, an HDYO ambassador. Awesome. Thank you all so much for being here. It's going to be a really good rounded conversation with lots of different backgrounds and experiences. Um, our hope is to shape this as much as possible to be relevant to the, the larger scale global community. But um, I want to I want to pick on. Um, is it OK if I call you Hugh or should I call yes, you Dr. That's Ricard? That's completely fine. You can call me Hugh. That's fine. Perfect. I forgot to double check that in the introductions. You, uh, one of the things I know that you are very well known in the patient community in the UK as well as the scientific community. But for those who don't know you, do you mind sharing a little bit about what brought you into working with the HD community and what that journey looked like? Okay, well, I started as a when I was a young doctor. I suppose you call it a resident if you were in the US, maybe even an intern, which is which is earlier. Anyway. Uh, early days in my training as a doctor, but after I qualified, I went to a genetics clinic um, in the local hospital as part of my training. And in there, um, that was the, when the test first came out. So people were coming there for predictive testing for the first time, really, individual predictive testing. And I met a, a, an uh, employee of the Huntington's Association of England and Wales because they employ specialists of risers around the country. And... Um, she went, Hugh, you'll like this. You should do this. And I started doing it. And then I just gradually sort of, I did lots of other things in the olden days, all sorts of other illnesses. But as time has gone on, I've just gradually ditched all the rest of them and got completely into Huntington's disease because there's enough to do. And um, I've just enjoyed it all. And it's, it's just been a, a great pleasure to do it all of my life. So I could retire. I'm, I'm sort of officially retired, but I like it too much to stop, really. You, you became part of the HD community. So That's there is it. no retiring. That's it. There's no <laughs> like flipping Jimmy Pollard, isn't it? It's like there's no yeah. you don't get away from it. 
Well, I'm so glad that the the HDA in the UK reached out and encouraged you to do that because you've made such a tremendous impact into countless I, lives. So, yes, the other thing I would say is another. Uh, I would give a shout out to Jimmy Pollard as well, who I'm sure you all know well. He came to lecture in Birmingham about 25 years ago when I was just at the beginning of this journey, and his talk about what the internal world of a person with HD might be like, especially towards the latter stages, was so mind blowing for me that it, it that really sparked my interest as well. So I'm, I'm indebted to him. So I'd like to pass on the Jimmy model to other people as well. Okay, I think we all are indebted to him for sure. Well, thank you much for sharing that. It's just always nice to personalize the um, the researchers' experiences and, and share a little bit more to kind of humanize who you are, because you are human and, and you've been so entwined with the community. So thanks for sharing that. I guess the other thing I would say is that I'm really, although I'm a psychiatrist, I'm particularly interested in disease-modifying therapies. And we've done most of the disease-modifying therapy trials in the UK. We were on the sites for the first IONIS trial. And um, so that's what got me in. I'm, I'm not, one thing I'm not is I'm not a molecular biology scientist. So I don't really have the fine detail of molecular biology science down. Um, but I guess that's allowed me to look at the broader picture because I'm not bogged down with molecules. I, I get lost. You know, there's molecular talks in Strasbourg and other places. I usually get lost after about five minutes of those. Um, I think that makes us feel more normal because whenever, if anybody out there has ever listened to a very in-depth science uh, conversation or even those that are meant to be community facing where maybe they go a little bit too deep into acronyms or the science behind it without making it conversational, you can easily feel lost. <laughs> oh, yes. A hundred percent. Yeah. Well, so this conversation came about because you approached me, um, you mentioned Strasbourg, we were recently at the European Huntington's Disease Network and Enroll HD meeting, and he wanted to understand what young people feel about access. And access is a big word. Of course, there's access to education, access to resources. Today, we're going to talk a little bit more about access when it comes to either treatments or therapies. Um, and I even want to expand that a little bit with even access to research and clinical trials that are out there. So, Hugh, why, if, why, have, why did you approach us? Why was this an important conversation that you wanted to understand and invest in? Um, right. It, it became apparent to me in Vienna, which was the last EHD, oh, the last but one EHDN conference, which is in 2018, one pre-pandemic, and everybody was at the high point of the roller coaster about the first disease-modifying therapy, which was Tommy Nursin, and it felt like there was a sort of celebratory mood in that conference, and um, it was looking like that drug might get licensed sooner rather than later at that stage, and that was certainly the feeling in the room. Um, and I became aware that if that were to happen, as a community, we were really unprepared for what would happen next, mm -hmm. which was people would talk about, well, you know, is, are we going to license this drug? How is it going to be paid for? It's going to be really expensive. And the, the, I was thinking, I was getting nervous that lots of my patients would be turning up at my door going, can I have some Dominersen, please? And I'd have to say, well, I have no idea how to get it to you, and nobody's agreed about it. So that was making me anxious, and it was also making me anxious that nobody else appear in the community appeared to be thinking about that, or very few people were thinking about it. And I, I, I sort of came to the conclusion that we have a massive blind spot in the community about that, because we have amazing molecular biologists. Uh, you know, the things that they can do are incredible, but there are so few people thinking about this, the practicalities of the next steps. And I feel like that's not, that's a problem in the whole of the HD community. And because those people aren't there, I could describe who those people are that need to be in the room that aren't really in the room. Um, then there's nobody else pointing it out, or not many people pointing it out. Um, so when I, I also, so I, and that that feeling hasn't gone away. I mean, I know that the Tom and Erson trial, the HD1, didn't work out as planned. So it didn't, it lost a bit of the urgency. Mm -hmm. um, 
but it's still it's still urgent and i still think we're way behind the curve and there are one or two i've got some fellow travelers now a few um but there's a lot there's so much to be done that we're not really doing and i don't think we have the expertise at the moment and i felt like the young people would have a lot invested in this which is why i approached you because the younger people are more energetic generally more prepared to you know get involved with things um and so that's really why i approached you thinking well there's an there's an alliance there that could be made yeah and now that there are so many other therapies being looked at it gets even more complicated because it's not even it's not even just you know thinking back to 2018 it was one very specific treatment which is still in the process of being um explored with tom and Erson, but now you have gene therapy you have um, things like small molecules, which could be um, distributed in capsule form, which on the, you know, on the surface seems really accessible because it's a pill versus having, an, you know, to go into the clinic to get a lumbar puncture or um, brain infusion. But there are so many different complexities with this. And, and I think you are right. The young people um, are going to, realistically speaking, timeline wise, probably depending on their age, maybe the benefactors of this research in a in a therapy way or a therapeutic way and and on top of the fact of just wanting to lobby and, and get support for the whole community young people really are engaged and, and want to do something and this could be a piece to that uh, molly i'm interested from your perspective why why did you want to be a part of this conversation yeah so there are two reasons that i was excited to be part of this conversation the first being that I wanted to provide a unique perspective about the barriers on access to treatments and clinical trials, specifically in Northern Ireland. Having studied in England for 10 years, I've been able to witness the stark differences in access to treatment and clinical trials when comparing England and Northern Ireland. People would actually be wrong to assume that Northern Ireland, as part of the UK, have the same opportunities to access care and clinical trials as people in England do. And I think it's important for people to be aware that England, Scotland and Northern Ireland have completely separate HD charities and also very different degrees of accessibility to treatments and clinical trials. And then secondly, and on a more selfish kind of level, I just wanted to be a part of this really excellent panel of people to discuss this important issue with. Um, I think everyone here brings great strengths in this call and, you know, Jenna continues to make progress on breaking social stigmas associated with HD. And then Lauren, who's from the US, can give a completely different perspective from me on access to treatments and clinical trials. And then finally, Hugh has always been a huge inspiration of mine and has multiple research interests which overlap with my own, such as the importance of social cognition in HD. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. I think you're right. The assumption is, is the UK as a whole is very similar versus the individual countries. And then even, you know, cascading that thinking of the European Union to even on a larger scale is EU. Um, surely they have the similar thing since they have the different regulatory um, agencies that work on, on approval. But really, it's a country conversation, too, when you think about access. Lauren, why did you want to be a part of this conversation? Um, I, I think it's a really important one and, and to kind of go back a little bit, I um, I worked at a, a cancer center pharmacy years ago um, and that's when it really started hitting me where we are lacking in this conversation in this area um, because it, when you work in a cancer center pharmacy, it's a specialty pharmacy um, and having to uh, look at prior authorizations for people and how much those drugs cost and getting those drugs to people and all of these things. And I'm sitting here thinking, well, this is cancer. What happens when HD gets something and we're not having this conversation at all? Like we're not, it's not even on the radar. So um, yeah, I just remember thinking that to myself. And, um, and so it became a very important part of, of what I, talk about. Um, I, I joined the um, Institute for Gene Therapies um, as their patient advocacy advisory board um, for that reason, to help with the cost of gene therapies in the U.S. Um, and I think that that's great, 
but the conversation needs to be in the community too, because we need to, one, know the reality of what this means, that if something does get approved, that doesn't mean you're immediately going to get it. There's a process for after it's approved. And I don't think people are ready for that. And two, okay, if we know that now, <clears throat> what steps do we take to make it happen, right? So it's not, oh, well, gosh, there's another big barrier. So we need to stop and everything's bad. No, it's okay. We have knowledge now. How do we take that knowledge and then put a plan in place to make sure that everything moves forward? So um, yeah, I, I think this is a very important conversation. Yeah. And I think that was, that was, we touched on it a little bit. We hosted as a part of the HD community ad boards, which is a partnership with the European and international Huntington associations, as well as HDYO, we hosted a global roundtable discussion to, and part of that was, was about access and some of those, you know, the readiness of the community and, and what we know and overwhelmingly the 12 community members with a variety of different backgrounds said, yes, we want to be a part of these conversations. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think it's, it's a really important topic to start talking about because as you said, we're already behind a little bit in some of these issues. And, and I think for those doing the science, they want to kind of wait and say, well, we don't know what this is going to look like yet. But if we are looking at educational pieces of it, we need to educate now. So then that way, when there is an action plan or we need, can be a part of the action plan and we can provide that feedback and um, we just can't wait for education until there's the privilege of having the end result on the scientific piece of it, in my yeah. opinion, anyway. Yeah, exactly. Well, I want to look a little bit about um, some of the biggest challenges when it comes to access. And I'm going to start by picking on Hugh again. Um, so thinking about access again in the clinical trials and then hopefully the treatment piece of it, which is which is that tangibility of it. Hugh, what are some of the challenges when it comes to access um, for participating in research or clinical trials in the global community, do you think? Um, that's a good question. I guess the first thing to say is that it depends on your your viewpoint, where you're coming from. If you're coming from the point of view of a company right now, I would say on the whole, they would say uh, clinical trials are recruiting well in HD. In other words, they have enough people for them at the moment that might change in the future. So if you ask somebody from a company, they would say, um, in terms of running a clinical trial effectively, they're doing that really well around the world, I think, at the moment. And that's be partly because the research community with Enroll HD and other things, we've, we're really well set up to delivering good clinical trials to companies. So from that point of view, I would say we're, do, we're probably punching above our weight and doing good. But I guess that doesn't apply to everybody around the world. And so there's two problems with that. The first one is... Um, certain countries are just excluded from that and i mean most companies most countries in the world are excluded from that actually it's only a very few countries that are included and so that's i guess unfair in itself not sure how to fix that but also it might also mean that the types of people that we're studying may not necessarily be representative of the global population so that's scientifically problematic um the other the other issue that i think is going to come up is that a lot of the big centers have piled into doing, uh, let's say, RNA suppression research um, early doors. And most of the new trials say you can't be in a new trial if you're in one of the old trials. So my guess is they're going to run out of people in the big centers. And so either some stuff has got to change there. I don't know whether or not they're going to change the criteria of who they let in or other sites are going to get more of the action. Um, I suspect it might end up being the former. I don't know. Yeah, and that's some of the work that we're doing. And, and part of our survey series is where are people seeking support and resources and how are people accessing information? And although we have amazing uh, neurology teams, young people specifically, mm -hmm. most aren't going into the neurologist office. So when you think about some of the traditional recruitment methods, if you're just going to um, these big centers who are reaching out to the patients only that they see, then 
you do run the risk of oversaturation of clinical trials if you're going to the same sites who are looking at the same patients that the same companies are all after it gets really challenging so we that's, really that's, that's about to happen i think up until now it hasn't really happened but i think that's if you look at some of the really big sites i can think of a couple now who piled into hd1 gen hd1 for instance um and put a load of patients in those patients are effectively at the moment the way the rules are excluded from participating in future trials mm -hmm. um, and probably i would imagine if you were to research center if you had you if you had things your way you probably want to do the same people again because you sort of know they're reliable you sort of know what you're dealing with and uh, of course that's easier than thinking about somebody who you don't know from out of town who may come with a bunch of complications that you're not previously aware of so I guess from the point of view of the centers, that might look like a more attractive prospect, but it doesn't seem particularly fair. Well, and it, well but and also those not, people there. Sorry, go ahead, Lauren. It's also causing a problem of, of, you know, those of us who go and we participate in research and clinical trials and observational studies, mm -hmm. you know, we recommend the sites that we go to, right? If they're really good, or if they're not, then we're not going to recommend them. But the other thing that we then run into is as we're recommending those sites, those sites are getting so inundated with stuff. They don't have the resources to be able to handle all of it. And then we run into, okay, well, who's going to then help with those resources and help to, to cover expenses, either to help grow those really great locations or to kind of help spread out the site and make them into good locations for people. Um, so I think that's what we're really seeing now too. And I would say nobody's really, I don't know anybody at an institutional level that's working on that particularly, except perhaps um, Enroll or CHDI who fund Enroll, because they do have this, what they call the Global Site Investigator Database, where you sort of go on and you put in all your details and somebody might help you to develop your site a bit more. Um, but to be honest, nobody's being paid to develop any but another site apart from their own. <laughs> so mm -hmm. that's the chances that you, you've got to have somebody at a site who's really into doing it. Yeah. So, Otherwise, it falls apart, right? Like completely yeah. falls apart. It's really hard to do. It takes years to learn how to do it. Yeah. I think another piece of, of the clinical trial puzzle, too, is um, country regulations um, and what they're able to do. So from my understanding, Sweden, for example, has had a hard time getting things set up even with Enroll HD because they don't, they, it, it's their policy. And I believe, and I, and I, if I misspoke and I'll put that in the comments, um, they don't want to send bio samples outside of the country and have access to those bio samples outside of the country, which makes it hard to facilitate research, even things like Enroll HD that shares that information across um, many different um, many different access points. Um, then you have some of the things when it comes to what resources are available and consistency in labs um, in order to meet the requirements of the clinical trial itself, um, which, so, which, which can be challenging. Um, and it takes extra work to find those sites in other countries when there could be those barriers set up that are unrelated to um, Huntington's disease. So just to come back on that then, it, it relates to the other access issue, which is access to drugs, mm -hmm. um, which is however we set up a structure for trying to solve these access problems, it has to take into account the fact that every country is slightly different. Every health system is slightly different. So we need to find a way of having a network that is based in as many countries as possible that has a sort of central way of comparing notes and helping each other. Yeah. Which is another reason I partly thought of HDO because they, you're at least, I don't know, it's a big responsibility, but um, I thought well, you've got <laughs> young people in countries all over the world who talk to each other, mm -hmm. and each country is going to have a slightly different solution to both of the access problems. So it seemed like, okay, that's maybe that's a good place to, or well, one of the good places to start. Oh, yeah. Molly, what are your thoughts about each other? Mm -hmm. Sorry. No, no, you're good. Yeah. Molly, what are your thoughts on on some of these access challenges when it comes to um, to research? Because you're in the lab right now doing research or, or have been. So what what do you see? What do you think? I think um, 
in terms of like access to treatments and clinical trials specifically in Northern Ireland I actually recently spoke to, about this very topic to a number of support groups for Huntingdon's in Northern Ireland and this enabled me to get some insight on what young people in Northern Ireland think about in terms of access and clinical trials in Huntingdon's but unfortunately over here the general consensus is that young people are unaware of clinical trials going on in HD and there's many barriers to access for potential future treatments in clinical trials um so in my mind I was kind of thinking about you know why that might be um and I think there's three main barriers to access for Northern Ireland and um, people with Huntington's and firstly it's the geographical barriers so many HD clinics in the UK are conducted in major cities in England, such as London, where the Huntington's Disease Centre is based, and Birmingham, where the Barbary Centre is based. And this kind of creates a perception that clinical trials are out of reach for people from Northern Ireland. And secondly, it could be down to a lack of research infrastructure and specialist knowledge. It just means that there's less active clinical trial sites here. Another point to note is that in spite of Northern Ireland having some of the best pharmacy schools in the UK and headquarters of pharmaceutical companies such as Alma, the universities don't currently offer pharmacology as a degree. So when I was doing my undergraduate, I had to go over to England. Um, mm. And this absence of dedicated pharmacology courses could mean that there's fewer clinical trial specialists here, and that leads to fewer locally led clinical trials. And then the final kind of barrier to access I believe there is a lower awareness about clinical trials among healthcare providers over here because firstly there is a clear shortage of neuropsychiatrists or even neurologists in Northern Ireland and as I described previously the lack of specialists in clinical trials means that the few neurologists that are present in Northern Ireland aren't really pushed to encourage more research opportunities and clinical trials to come here or they don't even really know about promoting the fantastic clinical trials that do exist in mainland UK by experts in Huntingdon's. So yeah, that's kind of my take on the problems over here specifically. Lauren, I'm interested in your thoughts because people tend to think that the US has um, easy access, especially considering that the FDA is usually one of the first agencies that um, a, a company may approach for approval processes and things like that. What does access look like in the H, in the, the HD community for the US? Um, I would say, I mean, we, we still face barriers that are, are similar to other countries. Um, I, I think that um, FDA has uh, very strict rules on guidelines on um, who can participate in clinical trials versus other countries, uh, which, you know, keeps people from being able to participate. Um, there are several of us who are in this prodromal stage of HD that want to participate. And we're told we're too healthy to participate, um, which seems crazy uh, because you have to, you know, meet certain criteria to be eligible. And uh, a lot of times we're told we're too healthy. So then people are like, and they're told, just wait until you have movements. Um, and so nobody will pay attention to what research is going on until they're actually symptomatic because they're told not to. Um, I should say clinically symptomatic. Clinically to, symptomatic, to, that's right. Yeah. Clinical diagnosis would be movements. Um, mm -hmm. For myself, I don't even, my diagnosis is not Huntington's disease. My diagnosis is neurocognitive disorder related to HD um, in order to, you know, to have a diagnosis of anything, um, you know, and I went through neuro, neurocognitive testing and everything went to a neuropsychiatrist that I follow up with every 18 months. Um, but the neurologist said, there's no reason for you to be here. And this is the neurologist who was doing research in my area. And I said, I will not go to somebody who, you know, who's not knowledgeable on HD. Um, and so then I transferred to Georgetown. I'm literally going out of state to be able to do my all of the research I was doing before. Um, but there are gaps in my enroll information because of, you know, of a, an expert that retired and the whole research team fell apart. And um, so then years of no 
data in Enroll HD, which I'm now back in um, through Georgetown. Um, but you know, the sites matter and not all sites are the same. Um, <clears throat> there are a lot of problems with uh, being able to uh, leave work to attend uh, a clinical trial visit. A lot of times you can't be honest about where you're going um, <clears throat> because you're afraid of discrimination. And um, hold on one second. Um, you have to use paid time off in order to, or sick days in order to go and attend clinical trials or observational studies, uh, which can be a barrier as well, because people who are already caregivers and, and trying to take care of their loved ones or uh, whatever, don't have those days. So um, I think there are so many different barriers that we face here. Uh, you know, we're lucky because we do have, you know, Enroll HD here, like that's always like, that's the basic thing here. And when I heard that it wasn't even in certain countries, for me, that was shocking. And I, I really, um, it really put it on my radar, like the global community truly needs so much more and made me look outside of, of the U.S. Um, and that's been a big thing in the past few years for me is just seeing how much is needed globally. Um, but yeah, I mean, in the States, we definitely face barriers. I just wanted to come back on something that you said, Lauren, which is interesting, and it's a change, actually. Um, you can see now the Huntington scientific community is moving away from the idea of motor onset. It's yeah. been a long time coming. Yes. It's been a very <laughs> long time coming. And um, if we had a very long time, uh, a long evening in the pub, I could probably bore you to death about why I think that's happened. Uh, but at least you could say the good thing about that is that it's changing and it's mainly changing because uh, companies and the research community see that early intervention, as it is with many illnesses, uh, is more likely to be uh, useful. And you can see that in the criteria for the new trials now. Yeah, it's it's sneaking back earlier and earlier. Um, but that does come with problems, as you rightly said. Um, because we're, I mean, I'm doing the um, a Generation HD2 trial. I've got a patient on there who's a youngish mum with five kids. And she's working and her husband's working and they've got five kids at home. And she's ostensibly pretty well. Yeah. Uh, uh, but that's a big difference between her being part of a clinical trial, which is a massive headache, as you've described, Trying to, she's really committed, as you yeah. might imagine. And she's doing all the things you're saying, like, you know, juggling, spinning plates, trying to get to this trial. Um, so that's great. But it's also, from a methodology point of view, it's very hard to measure outcomes over a short period of time in people who are on the surface basically well. It, that's quite a complicated process. How do you do that is a scientific challenge. There are ways you can think about doing it. And I would say that the research community are fairly engaged with that process, but it's taken a very long time to shift the idea that before you have career, you know, career means you are now Huntington's is a binary. You don't have it and then you have career and then you have it. Yeah. I mean, that's been part of the received wisdom of Huntington's disease uh, probably since 1900 or something. Yeah. And that's mm -hmm. taken a lot of shifting. But I think it is shifting, actually. I agree. I agree. I, I see a shift and it's great, um, especially for those of us who are experiencing things. And we keep trying to say, I'm experiencing something that's not me, you know, and um, and it, it's so funny. I'm going to tell this story really quick because I was trying to tell Jenna in order to explain symptoms. But when I got my neurocognitive testing, um, one of the things that they said is I, I tested hygiene. So I've had two different, I had a baseline neurocognitive test done when I was 29 years old. So I would know if there would be any changes. Okay. And this is because I was a caregiver for my father. And I was like, I need to know if there are any changes. So then in October of 2022, when I got terminated from my position um, at the Alzheimer's Association um, for, uh, for work performance issues, I went ahead and got neurocognitive testing done. And they were able to compare. And in both, they said that I was I was high genius, but 
what happened was I had significant decline in executive function. So basically it would be like going from hygienist to functioning at what most people function at. And people would look at that and go, oh, well then it's okay. You're functioning like a normal person now. And I was like, but for me, that's not okay because I've always been here and it takes more energy for me to be even at the normal, right? Like it's not, it's more energy and there's fatigue and there's brain fog or basically it's not even a fog. It's literally like you stop. Lauren, the argument that people have always given which I don't agree with is um, uh, that patients in that situation wouldn't want to know that stuff. So it's best not to say anything and not to test and just say it hasn't happened yet. That's a way of people who argue not in, in the opposite way to I would argue would say, if you tell people it'll only make it worse because they'll overthink it. And they so called a nocebo effect or something, mm -hmm. which means, and that's, been the one of the arguments people have given for not going down that road of um saying there's a prodromal thing there but, but i think that it's really it's a, argument, personal, it's a personal it's a personal thing, decision but also, but also going back to being proactive with health we expect people to be proactive with their health not reactive in everything else in everything else cancer screenings everything and yet here we are in hd not acting that way we're being reactive and not proactive when it comes to our own health and saying okay look if you have a deficit here how do you work on that deficit do you need to take an off label medication do you need to do um you know some type of occupational therapy physical therapy something like that and provide those resources so much earlier than we're getting them and be proactive because at this point our brains can work in different ways and help to adapt and um, compensate where later on they can't. So, you know, to me, it's about being proactive, but yes, as far as testing goes, it's a very personal choice in wanting to know that information. And I totally understand that, but I also am very, very big on being proactive with my own health. Yeah. And I think that it's a, uh, so go ahead, Molly. Yeah, no, I just when you said about being um proactive and not reactive, I, I like I totally agree with this. And this is something I see a lot over here in Northern Ireland. I feel like, you know, until you have the career like symptoms that, yeah, a lot of people just ignore you. Yeah. And, you know, my mom, you know, has not seen a neurologist in at least six years. And that's you know, because people just think, oh, well, you know, you look fine, you're right. sitting okay. And, you know, you're just pushed to the side. And instead of that, you know, being proactive and thinking ahead and thinking, oh, you know, what could help in the future or, or these changes might happen? What could we do now? You know, it is very much a reactive process, which is so disheartening, you know, for both the individual and the caregivers surround that individual 100 percent, 100 percent. it is very I, discouraging i don't know whether or not um the other thing in the states i think it will definitely exist in northern ireland and exists in the uk which is you see a geneticist you have a test mm -hmm. and let's say you carry the gene in the test then they'll see you once a year where they'll do a physical examination and basically say has it started yet that's a question that's a cause it's it's, it's accept a practice for clinical geneticists and that what they mean is do you have career or dystonia yeah i think pretty much um and i think that's probably a wrong-headed approach um we don't we so in the states you go to a genetic counselor mm -hmm. and get your genetic test and the majority of places that's it they don't provide anything after that mm -hmm. they don't provide information after that they don't direct you to any resources after that it's literally okay here's your test result and well, that's also bad. <laughs> you know, um, that's what that was going to be my point. I brought up to kind of this conversation of do you want to know the progression and interventional things and it being a personal decision. And at the beginning of this conversation, I said how we're talking about a really specific kind of access, but it also ties into access to support services and this need to work together within 
clinics to either lobby for better support services within the clinic themselves, whether that be social workers or having a comprehensive center that offers different types of therapies um, like speech, occupational, physical therapy, or continuing to enhance and, and explain the importance of where advocacy associations come into play to provide that support service because you can't just tell people you're gene positive there's nothing we can do for you until you're symptomatic i really i, I want to do a, a, a poll on this just in general about this whole concept of i'm not sick yet so i can't participate in clinical trials is that the right message we hear that a lot where people go in to do an enroll um, assessment, which happens to pair up with a neurology visit, and they say, oh, I'm not sick yet. I don't have symptoms that are measurable. And it's like, but do you have to, is it sick to participate in clinical trials or too healthy? Is it is it disease progression and symptomatic and, and that, you know, is that the better term to be able to use? Because that is a stigma that we see in the community is I'm not sick yet, so I can't participate in research, which isn't true. And then what does that do to the mentality and emotional well-being of those individuals to label themselves sick at a certain point rather than symptomatic? So I think it's, it really does, this whole idea of access ties into a lot of different challenges um, because we hear that all the time globally about the many discrepancies with, with um, support services, discrepancies with how people are told about genetic status. We had someone who shared their story about being in a large room with all of their families, getting blood drawn, and then getting an envelope all at the same time where everybody's just opening it up and that's what they were told and the person just left and gave them envelopes and they're in this large room. I mean, in, you know, so even thinking about access to clinical trials, there's so many things that we also have to fix while having these conversations. It, it's definitely challenging. Yeah. I actually wanted to pick up on a point that Hugh mentioned because this again just shows you know the complete differences even from England to Northern Ireland like I think you said Hugh that when you get your genetics result and then you get reviewed every year I mean yeah. I mean that doesn't happen over here my mom okay. was diagnosed um and then she wasn't seen for another 20 years until she requested an appointment you okay. know it's just it's very much like you get tested okay. and then um, that's it you know you just you deal with it okay so for for us here, um, obviously, like we we have groups like HG Genetics and BJ View who who are trying to change things uh, on, when it comes to genetic t testing, and it's amazing, it's incredible. I love what he's doing. Um, but you know, when it came to my dad, even when um, he was first uh, getting involved in research, because he was in Pharos HD, um, and uh, that is what got him a, a yearly visit right he didn't he, he didn't wouldn't have that in, otherwise right he would have not been seen otherwise we would have never known about him showing any type of symptoms had he not been going yearly for his pharaoh's hd visit and then eventually the enroll hd visit um and it's the same with me like i was only going to the neurologist yearly for my enroll hd visit and you know they're not telling you anything about progression they're not telling you anything about what to look to for it's literally you go in you you're you're stuck and you're given these surveys and you do all of this stuff and then you leave without information and it's becomes frustrating because you know cool. like why why continue to do obviously I understand why you continue to do it I continue to do it but you also get to a point of frustration because it's like here I am giving all of this information giving so much of myself and not getting anything back coming back no Jenna, yeah. I'm also, sorry, I'm, Go I'm ahead. Also where we need to talk about the uh, drug access. Oh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I was going to say, I was, was going to deter back to that. So this is a huge access issue, and it, and I love the fact that it snowballed into a lot of different <laughs> access challenges, because that's sorry. the reality of this disease. <laughs> Um, but Hugh, thinking specifically, let's let's go down the line and say that there's a therapy that has been approved by the EMA or FDA or what have you. It's showing efficacy. It's showing safety. It's disease modifying or whatever the kind of treatment that it's looking at. What are some of the issues with actually distributing and having access to those types of treatments? Okay, I'll I'll, I'll keep it as as sort of basic as I can because there's about a million. But uh, let's do the, the big ones. I think the first one is, as you know, is that licensing authorities and then paying bodies are reliant on data 
about, let's call it burden of illness, quality of life, function. So real world outcomes, not your how much hunting, mutant Huntington you have in your cerebral spinal fluid. But I guess rightly they say we need to know that the patients are feeling better, doing more stuff, getting on with their life better, staying well longer, all those things. And I would say as a research community uh, and as the people who do biotech and pharma as well, we're really poor at that and we've neglected it. So even if I, if you said to me, what's the best measure of quality of life in Huntington's disease, which you think that would be a basic question, I could say, I've done loads of research on this and I don't know, as far as I could think, most of them are rubbish. Amen. <laughs> so you've got a situation yeah. here. You've got some molecular biologists that can give you a bit of RNA that's individually tailored and goes to your brain cells and suppresses the Huntington gene. And that's amazing. Don't get me wrong. It's brilliant. Yet they come into clinic and you're asking people to fill in a little form like, you know, I'm just paraphrasing. How are you at tying your shoelaces or something? You know, and it's it's the, it's a comparison between something that's ultra modern and it's basically quite primitive. It is. And I think, and that's at least partly because as a research community, we're not that interested in it. And it's not very exciting research. It's not, most people who research in HD are fascinated by molecules and fair play to them. There's not, there's, I mean, I look around in the room, say so how many people in this room are fascinated by quality of life and function in HD in an academic nerdy way? And the answer is virtually no one. Yeah. So that's a massive blind spot. Yes. Um, I've been, it's not helped by the companies. So there's this thing, um, burden of illness studies, some people call them BOI or boy. There's this thing I call the companies do, I call it boy washing. Boy washing is, is that companies feel like they have to do burden of illness research. You know, some of the big companies feel like they have to do burden of illness research, but they don't, so they want to be seen to do it, but they don't actually want to spend that much money on it. And so they will do big burden of this and there's been loads of them I could name them but I don't really want to get into trouble um they do say, big, I'm a part of one <laughs> they do big studies like this but they on the whole they're of a poor quality and when they and and what happens to that data I don't really know there's one or two exceptions to that rule but I'd say at least 80% of them are poor and you know they're poor because when you see their data you look at bits of their data and think that can't possibly be true. That shows that the people who are doing it don't really understand what they're doing. And these companies who do it, they will probably subcontract another smaller company to do it, who will then subcontract a market research organization to do it, who then will ask a bunch of physicians who are usually not experts in the area to review case notes after hours for, you know, $50 a case or something, whatever it is. And the quality of the data is... I think, in most cases, quite poor, which is terrible. I felt now, that way looking at the posters in EHDN about this stuff. I, I, that is exactly how I felt whenever I was walking through. So that's number one. Number two is there is some good quality of life data out there that we're able to show how good some of these scales are. And that lives really with... It's a bit technical this the placebo arms of clinical trials so within clinical trials in the placebo arm people who are not taking drug they're still filling out I'm not saying active but they're still filling out lots of different quality of life scales over like let's say a two-year period you know every two or three months they're filling in quality of life scales and these are people who aren't taking active drug and so you've got a really nice way of modeling how these scales might change over time so it's a beautiful data set and that data set is almost impossible to get hold of. And I've tried a lot. Mm. So I know where it is. Why? Oh, well, I, uh, that's a long story, Lauren. Okay. I'm not entirely sure, to be honest with you. But um, I know, I, I sort of know who's responsible for holding on to that data. And yeah, and I suppose that's why we need your community partly is to start asking some of those questions and say why yeah like just like you said why who do i need to talk to yeah to make sure it happens yeah so there's that bit that's a huge i would say that's a big challenge 
the next bit is how do we have the infrastructure for delivery? That's a really difficult question because we don't know the mode of delivery yet. If it's a tablet, that's not so bad. If it's intrathecal, well, that's, you know, we're looking at that with Alzheimer's at the moment. I guess that will work eventually. If it's into the brain, I just have no idea. Yeah. So I don't think we can get too hung up on that at the moment because we actually don't know. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that could take a while before. So I don't think that's where we should put our energies at the moment because we it would be just too much for not much reward. Uh, then the next thing is general health economics. So that we really need some really good studies or good models for, for instance, saying if you, like for instance, Huntington's disease, classically a sort of situation where somebody might start to become functionally impaired they may have young children they might be working full-time and it's common you know the kids are like 12 13 years of age and they're working full-time or not full-time and things are starting to change a bit um could you have a health economic model which says if you took someone like that and put all the clock back by you know five or six years even what difference would that make to the whole family unit massive yeah. Yeah. So the kids don't bunk off school to look after mum or dad. You know, they could get, if you like, fledged from the nest and get a bit more financial independence. And so those are the sorts of discussions I think we ought to be having as a community very broadly. And so we need to find a way of linking in staging systems, whereabouts you are in the illness, with how much it costs to the various people to have those arguments. But I think we should be preparing for that at the moment. And not many people are. So we need advocacy to someone to be doing that stuff. That's, yeah. Sorry, I was making notes. So I guess those are the big areas. It's measuring quality of life and functioning, getting hold of that right data, seeing what's the best way of doing that. Because right now that's rubbish. That's our worst bit. Um, thinking about delivery of drug. Well, I don't think we can do much about that because we don't really know where that's going to go. And then finally, trying to map on HD specific cost issues to stages. Mm -hmm. So what is it about HD? Now, some organizations, are you familiar with NICE? Mm -hmm. Yes. It's because it's a, it's, a, it's a UK thing, isn't it? But it also, it's got house currency around the world. NICE are into this thing called quality adjusted life years which means how many extra years of good quality life does this treatment give a person? And, you know, at the moment, in a, with the National Health Service, they have this figure like for each quality adjusted life you, you gain from a treatment, the UK government is prepared to spend £30,000. That's their limit, but not more. But in certain cases, they will exceed it. So how does that map into you know, these sorts of drugs that might be licensed. Are we even in the ballpark for that? So these Molly are all... Lauren. The... Yeah, go on, sorry. I'll shut up now. No, you're... No, 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 no. no. I was just going to say uh, thoughts for, for what you... I know, Lauren, you are emphatically nodding. Um, I am, yeah. And taking that. Uh, just curious, uh, Molly, what are your thoughts on some of those assessments and um, analysis and what some of the challenges that we face with access? Yeah, I would definitely say that I agree with a lot of them. Um, I think um, there's, you know, a lot of things that need to be considered about, you know, equitable access to treatments, you know, in some locations, strengthening healthcare systems, particularly in those that get left behind often um, by providing more training to healthcare professionals will be essential. And, and I thought affordability needs to be considered as well, because it's important to ensure that treatments are affordable and accessible perhaps through like global health initiatives and things. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, and I go back, Hugh, to the fact that this is the stuff that not many researchers are interested in, right? So how is it that we get other researchers who are interested in this to help, right? And, to, and how do we, as, as the research community and as the HD community collaborate to make it happen? Um, you have to make a loud noise, I think. Yeah. You have to say, we're the we're the people who matter. We're the you know patients, potential patients, family members. 
it's actually in the end it's about us it's not about you as scientists because the worst thing you can do is make an amazing molecular cure that only billionaires can have yeah. that's a massive you see some scientists would think of that as success as a success but it's actually a huge fail right yeah uh, so i think you have to think well who funds research who does research who organizes research what are the networks that organize research conferences and you know as a community you need to go to them and say we've identified this as a gap why aren't you doing anything mm -hmm. and put pressure on them i like it i don't that's not i i suppose yeah with that's why i'm i suppose i'm trying to build a bit of an alliance yeah mm -hmm. do that of course. You know, to, to respectfully go to these people and say look we think this is a gap Mm -hmm. we were, you're brilliant at these things but these bits as a community we're not good at so what are we going to do about it but your voice is strong so you, I guess you just need to make it heard yeah I think like Huntington's I totally agree you know you have to make a noise about it even with the research I've done on my PhD in Parkinson's like I'm trying to promote it everywhere I go go to every conference do every talk at the support groups the annual general meetings and just trying to raise awareness of the importance of different things like social cognition and it's not all about like you know for Huntington it's not all about the Korea like movements you know and, and my case for Parkinson's it's not all about the tremors and and the Brady Kinesia, you know, there are so there's so much more than that. Mm -hmm. And you know, well, I, I don't know, for instance, uh, what HDO's position is regarding, I suppose, campaigning activities. I don't know whether you're set up to be a campaigning organization or a support organization or both or Jenna. Yeah, so it just depends on what the ask is. Um our our we have a small but mighty team, but it is small and resources are small. And when you think about some of these campaigns, you really need to have access to people resources and financial resources. So, for example, we are starting to work with the um, Act for ALS in the U.S. because there are components that could be beneficial to the HD community. What's Act for so ALS? Oh, sorry. Thank you. So Act for ALS was a movement that was passed by the U.S. government and supported by the FDA that allowed for funding specifically for ALS, which is, um, which is, I believe, in uh, in the U.K., it's the motor neuron um, disease. You call it there's Lou different... disease as well. We Lou call Gehrig. it some, some, yeah, Lou Gehrig. So there's a little bit of a different acronym for that. But yeah. The intent of that, even though it's called the Act for ALS, was to be supportive of all neurodegenerative diseases, and of which now that they're going for a second round of approval and trying to encourage other neurodegenerative diseases to take part to make sure that we are, um, that they are representing, that we can all benefit, whether it's financially benefit or through legislative efforts, things like that. So we support local legislative movements, but our biggest thing is being that connector for the global community and trying to get advocates involved, trying to um, get these information, this information um, passed along to the different communities. How can we help train local associations? Because we cannot be the expert. I live in the US, so I'm more knowledgeable about that. We have um, our charitable status in the UK as well. So we have knowledge on our team about that. But we can't be the experts in every single country's need you can be a catalyst, when it comes. Though. We can be a catalyst, but we can help create, um, you know, we can help create educational pieces, bring people to the table, have those conversations, and then also work with um, some of the larger associations who have broader scope to be able to focus on what would be traditional advocacy, um, whether that's advocacy with medical side of things or research or advocacy if it's regulatory and legislatively. Um, and our biggest piece of that is that partnership called HDCAB, HD Community Ad Board, with EHA and IHA. And my hope is um, that we can do some really specific conversations around some of these challenges to be if able you, to lobby some of those big companies. If you've got a seat at the table with the companies, you can ask them, you know, why, is your, why is your burden of illness research so bad? <laughs> why can't you <laughs> have access? To, you know, we have to do it in a nice way, don't you, I suppose. Uh, why Why do we not have access to the placebo arm data from your previous clinical trials that very good question what's interesting what's There's interesting is some 
What's interesting is if you ask, if you ask your advocacy folks, I would venture to say, because I've had some of those conversations before, specifically about placebo um, and, and trying to expedite clinical trials and, you know, kind of the ethical qualities of placebo mm. in certain trials versus others. And, um, and I've asked that question and they've also asked that question and come to hurdles too. So I think it is a bigger conversation that needs to be had at something maybe at some of these larger conferences where you have a lot of players and maybe some of the, the organizations that do restrict some of that. Because from an advocacy standpoint, I have asked people, um, you know, what information is used from your findings to then help other drug companies with their understanding of the disease or to be able to expedite, expedite things. And some companies are are able to do some things than compared to others. Um, mm -hmm. And some say, if it's not a part of Enroll HD, we don't access that information. So I think it, I think we need to have the, it's not an individual company conversation. I think it's a bigger research community conversation with many, 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 many different players at the same table. Oh, Absolutely. Because sure. they'll, they'll point fingers. Oh, yeah. And whether or not those fingers are true, it's kind of like, and it's not about pointing fingers. It's about no. where do the problems lie? Do we understand right. where the problems lie? And how can we help lobby on behalf of the community to make some change happen? Yeah. Yes. So I guess the other thing, as you mentioned, Jenna, which is with ACT for MS, which I've heard of before, um, is learning from other diseases. So there's specific learning from other diseases yeah. who are at different stages in this process, like spinal muscular atrophy or Duchenne muscular dystrophy, right. um, or even Alzheimer's a bit, um, different things you can learn from them. But then I say that in terms of this sort of advocacy work, probably the place with the most lessons, I think, is HIV over the years mm -hmm. yeah. that's, why, that's why i recommended that book to jenna which i'll recommend yeah. to lauren and molly how to survive a plague by david francis which i think i read that on holiday a few years ago and i thought oh yeah we could do with a bit more of that sort of thinking of an, an understanding and if you think about how well that community is managing globally in a much much more common illness than huntington's disease although probably the treatments are somewhat cheaper i would imagine you imagine how far that's gone now it's not all down to the advocates it's also you know the scientists and the government and all sorts of other people have done amazing things but it's a really good example of how that how individual patients and their families became active in that conversation and yeah to... and even and even als uh, when we have conversations with um, the als community they they actually did go to hiv advocates and find okay. out how they did what they did Read that um, book. Read the book. So, it's, yeah, it's a good book. I definitely will. Thank you. In my so in my perfect utopia of advocacy, I think, and this has been successful that I've known of um, a, a very small amount of times. We need to have a true consortium of advocacy to come together and create some global initiatives. Um, yeah. because, and it, and it has to be also supported by the research company and the bigger, the bigger companies who have the dollars, because again, advocacy organizations are largely, um, run by, by volunteers, resources. If you're going to do professional advocacy, it costs a lot of money, but sure. we need to come together and have some key initiatives that we push forward that have interest outside of it that are not self-serving individually for their own foundation's success. And that gets really challenging because of, of a lot of different characteristics and individuals who would have a seat at the table. But I think we have to do that. I mean, you you have to do that in order to make some of these big changes. So it's not seen as an HDYO project. It's yeah. seen as a community-led project, and that's, that's I think, where we need to start. It's so, how do we get there, though? How do how do we get that to happen? I'm doing some work. Okay. <laughs> I'm assuming to... you're going to email me. That. I would say and my, my, um, the the no, I'm going to let you know what I can tell you. What's gonna come well, that's what I mean. Is like whenever, <laughs> yeah. whenever it's uh it's uh to a point that you could share. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think you've got, you've got to be careful not to shoot yourself in the foot, which I think I've done already, uh, which is I put my hand up and I said, I'm really interested in this area. And I did quite a lot of work, particularly over lockdown on it. Um, I, and then I realized that my existence 
was a perfect excuse for other people not to do anything at all because yeah. they're like oh Hugh's dealing with that we don't even have to think about it and I was yeah. like no that's the exact opposite of what I need my job yeah. is to tell you you all have to think about it not them say oh well that's easy we've done with the problem now because that's Hugh's department he'll just fix it mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> so be careful I would person- say, be careful because I fall into that trap still no, there that- and that's why that's why creating a true consortium of players is helpful because then it's supported by this group and then the group has the signatures as a piece of like who's a part of the you know the puzzle and, and the support for that um because really they would speak on behalf of the community but it you can't this this whole and i I don't want to say squabbling because I don't have a better word. This whole kind of idea of being country specific or region specific is fine for certain pieces of it. But when we're trying to move big pieces forward, you have to bring the community together. And that's what this piece would be. So it wouldn't take away of the focus of what's going on. It unfortunately would add more work, which I know we're already spent, you know, way past spent on that. But if we could have those resources available, then it could be really important with expediting some tough conversations like access. Absolutely. Absolutely. So that just be a lot of work in the beginning, but then it it helps long term for sure. Yeah. So just to let you know what I'm doing at the moment for the sake of clarity of communication is I'm trying to have as many conversations like this as possible mm-hmm. and identify fellow travelers from wherever they might come, really. Um, and so I'd be really happy to work alongside you. Um, it's just trying to find out where the energy is. Yeah. And harnessing the energy. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, well, so- this, I think, has been a, a really fascinating conversation. Um, and it's... I think the important thing is, is to end this is what can the community of young people or even anybody who's watching impacted by Huntington's disease do to stay do to stay updated and educated on, on some of these topics? Um, Hugh, what would you suggest for those who either want to keep updated or get further involved? I suppose this is where the, the global and the local thing is tricky, because I think if you live in a particular place, wherever it is in the world, you've got to find out who what's happening in your local patch and also who your allies might be in a local patch and that might be you you might have to do that a little bit through hdo or you might have to do it through you know your huntington's association or or even through your local clinic or whatever it is whatever method you have of the the community getting together um so there's that bit is like finding out who your allies are locally and you and myself can act as catalysts for that and how we we our job maybe is to find a way a broader infrastructure that all those bits can interact and then it's find out who's making the decisions i think and start finding out ways of approaching them and that might be whoever's doing research it might be whose companies might be governments it's like where, where are the decision where are the barriers where are your there might be some local barriers but then there might be some more international barriers just find the barriers and that does take time and energy um so it's like, how do you keep your energy up? I suppose by having a good network of people that can talk and encourage each other and say, mm-hmm. yeah, we've got a bit similar to you here and we solved it like this, but it's not exactly the same as your situation. So we need ways of keeping our morale up. Mm-hmm. Um, Lauren and Lauren and Molly, what are your what are your thoughts of, of how you would like to see more information allowed for the community or stay involved or engaged for yourselves and, and even what you've known of the community members? I think um, in terms of like coming again from a perspective of Northern Ireland, like the HD charity here, H. Danny, you know, they're a great source of support and information. Um, I think like staying up to date with things like HD Buzz, the uh, research website for Huntington's and yeah, just reaching out to people, reaching out to organizations like HDYO. Yeah, that's why I stay up to date anyway. Lauren? Um, I would start with, uh, you know, for, for anybody who's watching, ask yourself why this is personally important to you and your loved one. Um, start there, write down why it's important to you. I and 
and realize that that right there, what you write down is what you need to be looking at and share that. If you, if they, if you feel like you can't do it yourself, if you can't reach out to somebody um, as far as like asking, why isn't this being looked at or reach out to a researcher, you can reach out to HDO. You can reach out to me. You can reach out to so many different people and say, hey, this is how I feel and I want it shared. And we are happy to do that. So I think um, you know, it's hard for our community when you're so inundated, especially young caregivers, especially, you know, um, people who are just trying to survive right now. And it's hard, right, to look beyond that. Mm -hmm. But you have to ask yourself, why is this so important to me? And look at that and then say, okay, well, if I can't do anything right now about it, let me share this in my perspective with somebody who can and who can take it to the ones who can make those decisions and really be involved in the conversation. And I think that's the piece I would really love to see. I think too, that needs to be done from the global community and advo advocacy tends to be a very privileged conversation, um, you know, for all the troubles that, that are, that are in access, all of us come from very similar communities. We all look the same. But there are so many more tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people impacted by Huntington's disease across the globe, and we need that representation. Absolutely. And I know that that comes with with a lot of fear and stigmas, um, you know, cultural, religious, um, putting yourself out there, labeling yourself in a different way. But we need those individuals to step forward. And I can tell you that I'm personally invested with making sure that that's done in a respectful and sometimes confidential way if needed, but sharing those stories and um, from across the globe is really important because um, so we need to have that access. We could do worse than hooking up with Factor H then, probably. We, again, having conversations on different key projects. <laughs> Because we we do have several ambassadors from from different countries, but the problem is is that it's one thing to do stuff on the back end; it's another thing to put themselves forward and be able to make that connection with the outward community. And that's where those stigmas come into play. Because um, now I can't remember, if I, but we have over a hundred ambassadors from I've read about thirty different countries. Um, but so, for example, in the Meta region, it's really hard for them to be on camera like this and share their perspective or do an ambassador. Yeah. Or take over in, which in the, the Middle East, North African region. Um, thank you for helping me with my acronyms. Uh, yeah, yeah. And so um, it gets really challenging because of very vast discrimination that may or may not happen if they come forward saying that they're impacted by HD. Um, and, you know, and it, even in the best of circumstances, it can be really challenging to come forward and to be able to, um, you know, that fear of labeling yourself with whatever way you self-identify within the community. So it's not that we don't have advocates, it's having the, the fact of how can we help propel their stories forward to what Lauren said, to be able to share the importance without putting them at risk or fear of being at risk. And, and that's I, and where I, I want to second that. To push yeah, because I want to second that because I also, you know, having the platform of the podcast, um, you know, we don't, we don't use video. Um, and so I have had several people who have come on and we've given them a different name or, mm -hmm. you know, or whatever. So they're able to share their story without worrying about that. Um, so if, if somebody's watching and you do not feel like you, you know, you're comfortable sharing, but you want to, like, there are options. You can absolutely come on the help for HD podcast and be whoever you want to be. You can give yourself whatever name you want. And I want to um, use avatars. Yeah. So then that way, if we do, if we do videos or a post, there's an avatar there, exactly. you know, like there are a lot of different ways that we can do this and there, you can do it anonymously um, as much as you feel comfortable with. But Absolutely. I think that's, that's a huge challenge that gets faced um, by this community is that like outward, outwardness. Yeah. hundred percent. So your podcast is called Help for HD, is it Lauren? Help for HD Live. Is that on Spotify? It is. Yeah. Right. I help didn't know. the number four. So it's help the number four HD. Oh, okay. HD. Oh, help for HD live. Look at that. <laughs> Thoughts from Strasbourg. Well, right? Okay. <laughs> I, I really, 
No, it's a really great podcast. Absolutely. Um, I want to thank you all so much for this time. Um, I think it's it's obviously the, the start of a conversation and how we can encourage young people to be um, active in having a seat at the table with this conversation because um, the unfortunate reality is these issues aren't going to be solved anytime soon, but we need to be poised to be able to share our voices as well as be um, change makers for when those decisions do happen and how can we, again, share those experiences and make that big change happen. So thank you so much for my phenomenal team of panelists providing your insights, your expertise, and your experiences such a valuable thing to have in this community. So thank you all so much and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.